Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, thank you, Roy Poston, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, the Bonnet organization is certainly a very worthy cause, and I'm very happy uh, to lend uh, my name and my uh, lecturing and my shurim to, uh, to the success of this uh, organization. At the beginning of Chumash Bereshis, at the beginning of Genesis, when it says, Bereshis Barai Lokim, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, so the next verse says, "Ha'aretz ha'isa sohu vavohu v'choshech al penei tahom." The world was tayu, or the universe, as it were, was tayu vavayu. Difficult to translate, but basically it means jumbled, confused, empty, chaotic. And there was darkness on the face of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This pasuk is very enigmatic on many, many fronts, and most of which I'm not even going to address. If God is creating the universe, then how could there be an antecedent water that God is hovering over? And what exactly is the tumult and the confusion and the chaos, which indicates some pre-existing entity? Those are great questions. I'm not even going to talk about them. But I just want to quote a medrash. The medrash says on the verse, the world was tayu, or the universe was tayu. Tayu means confused. This refers to the kingdom of Babylon, which conquered Eretz Yisrael and destroyed the temple. I'm sorry, tayu means empty. Tayu means astonishingly empty. They, they, they destroyed the temple, making the world empty. Bohu is confused. That is a remez to the kingdom of Persia in which Haman wanted to wipe out the Jewish people and the Megillah describes the city of Shushan as being confused and confounded. Ho'ir Shushan Navocha. Choshech, darkness, is the Gullus of Greece in which the eyes of the Jewish people were darkened to the truths of the Torah because they were attracted to foreign philosophies. And Pinay to home, the face of the depths, is the gullus of Rome, which keeps on going and going and going, seemingly having no end at all. What is the Medrash telling us? The Medrash is telling us that there is a concept of four exiles that are built into the very framework of creation. That in order for the world, just as before there is birth, there are birth pains, there are sufferings, there are struggles, so too in the cosmic birth of ultimate redemption, the world, and in particular the Jewish people, have to go through these four exiles. Now remember, Egypt does not count it as one of the exiles, because Egypt is a pre-exile exile, because we were not in Eretz Israel as a nation yet. But the four exiles that emerge primarily from the book of Daniel and from the book of Zechariah are said to be the Babylonian exile which destroyed the temple and exiled the Jews from the land of Israel. The Persian exile, which really was not a new exile. Persia simply conquered uh, Babylonia. And the Persian exile, of course, was the Purim story. And eventually the Persian Empire was conquered by Alexander the Great, which initiated the Greek period of Palestine or Eretz Israel, in which the Hanukkah story took place. And then we have the exile of the Romans, who actually destroyed the, they conquered the land of Israel, and then eventually they destroyed the temple, they exiled many, many, many Jews. And the Roman exile is said to still be here until the coming of the Mashiach. So... There is a problem here. In other words, according to Chazal's typology, now remember, one has to remember historically that the Mishnah, the Gemara, and the Medrash, certainly many Midrashim, and the entire, both Talmuds, were completed before the rise of Islam. There was no concept of Islam in the Talmud itself. And as far as the Talmud is concerned, based on their understanding of the book of Daniel, There are four exiles until the coming of the Mashiach. The exile of Babylon, the exile of Persia, the exile of Greece, the exile of Rome, which is identified with Edom, Asaph. Rome is identified 
with Esav, it is called Golos Edom, the Golos of the Red One. If you look at the well-beloved song that we sang recently during Hanukkah, Ma'oz Sur, right? everyone sings Ma'oz Sur. Some people only do the first stanza, but if you sing the whole Ma'oz Sur, I hope you will realize that Ma'oz Sur is a recapitulation of all of the travails that we suffered and God's redemption, starting with Egypt. Well, well, the first stanza is generic. The author's name was Mordechai, not the Mordechai of Purim fame, but, but, but much later. And the first stanza, Ma'osur, simply talks about how God is the source of our salvation. The second stanza talks about Egypt. The third stanza, Babylonia. The fourth stanza, Purim under the Persian rule. The fifth stanza is the only one about Hanukkah. That's why it has a separate nikon in many places. Yevanim nikvetsu alai. And the last stanza is referring to the redemption that we have not yet received. The redemption from the gullus of the evil red one, which is the gullus of Asaph. Now you may notice if you're singing Ma'osur and people have different sedurim or different uh, sheets of paper that sometimes they have different words in what they're singing because this was a very heavily censored stanza because at various points the Catholic Church took out statements that they regarded as anti-Catholic. So uh, this was a victim of censorship and the like. But the Ma'oz Sur is certainly reflecting the traditional idea of Chazal, that there are four Goliot, and these four exiles will last, or at least the last one will last, until the coming of the Mashiach. And that is why the Medrash refers to the Goliot of Adam as Pnei Tahom, the face of the depths. It's as if there's no apparent end. Think about it. The Babylonian exile was 70 years. The Persian domination of Eretz Israel, under standard Jewish chronology was around 54 years. Under secular chronology they make it 150 years. There's actually a very serious chronological issue there, which I'm not going to get into, but it was certainly less than 200 years. The Greek period, the Greek domination, which includes over a hundred years of Hasmonean rule, in which there was Jewish self-determination, but that's still part of the Hellenistic period, was 200 years. The Galut of Adon, if you, well, it depends how you count it, if you count it from the Roman conquest of, of Palestine, uh, then it would uh, be 2,000 years. If you count it from the destruction of the temple, it would be almost 2,000 years. So you're dealing with a galut that's extremely long. Now, before, uh, and, and again, if you look at the book of Daniel, you will see that the four galiyot are represented in many, many different ways, different metals, different wild animals. And the maral goes through great length to show the symbolic connection of the different beasts and the different metals to the nature of the galut. But the Maral explains, uh, basically, in a very simple, straightforward way, that each Galut has a dominant theme. The dominant theme of Galut Bavel is simply persecution and enslavement. Remember, it was Galut Bavel that took away Jewish autonomy by destroying the temple and exiling the Jews. So Galut Bavel represents the Galut of persecution and enslavement. The short galut of Persia represents the galut of genocide because that is what Haman wanted to do although Baruch Hashem he was not successful. The galut of Yavan represents the challenge of cultural assimilation because remember uh, the Greeks, the Yavanim were actually fairly benign in terms of giving Jews political and civil rights. They were not anti-Semitic in the Hitlerian or the Haman sense. They wanted the Jews to assimilate to the cultural norms of Hellenism. And many, many Jews did. In fact, perhaps a majority of the Jewish people did. The Hasmonians were the fanatical Haredim of the time, the ultra-Orthodox zealots. They were despised not only by the Ivanim, they were despised by many of their co-religionists as being retrogressive and primitive. And only because of their refusal to assimilate to the cultural norms of Hellenism, 
Antiochus then, you know, engaged in a war and the like. But in reality, the Galut of Yavan is not a Galut of physical persecution. It is a Galut of cultural assimilation. What then is the dominant theme of Galut Edom, which is so long? So the Maral says Galut Edom is simply an intensification and combination of all the other Galiut. So in Edom, there will be the Babylon of Edom, there will be the Paras of Edom, there will be the Yavan of Edom. So in Galut Edom, we have all of these things. We have times and countries which persecute Jews and enslave them. We have environments that seek genocide. The Holocaust is the outstanding example. And then, of course, we have the unique Nisio notes of living in affluent Western societies where the issue that Jewish people face is not so much blatant anti-Semitism but cultural assimilation and intermarriage. And as Lubavitcher Rebbe said, that might be the most difficult Nisayon of all. He once remarked, it was easier to be Jewish in Siberia than suburbia. Uh, because in Siberia, and of course he was in, well, I don't know if he was in suburbia, but he was certainly familiar with, with both those factors. His father died in Siberia. In Siberia, you couldn't escape being identified as a Jew. But today, everyone that is a Jew is a Jew by choice. The term Jew by choice is not limited to converted Jews but really everybody chooses because nobody forces you in the modern world to be a Jew. And of course, uh, Baruch Hashem, anyone that has moved to the land of Israel and they have placed their fate with the br- our brothers and sisters who live here is of course making that statement in a very, very emphatic and powerful, <coughs> powerful way. So once again, therefore, the Maral says, Edom is kind of like the Japanese. Like, what do the Japanese do? They take the ideas that other societies invent and they improve on them and make money out of them. So Edom simply rips off all of the different themes of all the other Goliot. And sometimes we have this, sometimes we have that, etc. Now, uh, before I, I get to Yishmael, because that's our topic, and so I will, well, I will obviously be talking about that extensively, I just want to raise just a very simple question. What do we mean by, uh, by the statement we are in the Galut of Edom? If Edom is defined as the Roman Empire that Chazal saw as genealogically related to Edom, the Edomites, and indeed, by the way, many have pointed out that the Etruscans, who were the, uh, the original occupants of the Italian peninsula, can in fact be traced to the Edomites, and therefore the Romans, as it were, is kind of a combination with the Etruscans. But the Roman Empire is long gone. The Western Roman Empire collapsed. The typical date that's given is 476. And while the Eastern Roman Empire, surviving in Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, lasted much longer, but that, that's the famous conquest of the Ottoman Turks, which was 1453, famous date, the fall of Constantinople. Either way, the Roman Empire as a Roman Empire is long gone. So in what way do we describe ourselves as still being in the Galut of Edom? There is no Edom in that sense. So the short answer is there are three reasons why we still describe our Galut until the coming of Mashiach as Galut Edom. Reason number one, because what the Edomites did to us has not yet been undone. If they destroyed the Beis HaMikdash, and we don't have the Beit HaMikdash, so we are still suffering the aftermath of Golot Edom. The fact that Edom is no longer ruling over us makes no difference. What they did to us has not been undone. That is reason number one. Reason number two is that in many, many ways, Rome is considered to be the progenitor of Western civilization. Now, I do understand that Rome itself essentially got whatever valid ideas they had from the Greeks. The Greeks are certainly the uh, foundation of Western philosophy uh, and thoughts and the like. But nevertheless, it reached Europe via the Roman Empire. Greek ideas spread through the Roman Empire, our very alphabet, no, no, not our alphabet, I shouldn't say our alphabet, I'm thinking like an American, but the, uh, the Latin alphabet, right, the American, the English alphabet 
is of course the Roman alphabet, the Latin alphabet, and the like. Uh, the legal system of both Europe and to, to a lesser degree, even England and the United States, the common law countries, is largely based on Roman law and the like. So in many ways, given the fact that Jews were overwhelmingly involved with Western civilizations, I'll discuss again, Islamic will be very relevant here, then certainly it's the Golot that Dome because of the encounter that the Jewish people have with European Western civilizations. The third reason why we are described as being in Golot Adom is that Rome at a very early date became identified as the seat of Christianity, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, indeed, it's very interesting why Rome achieved that historical significance. There actually was a bit of a disagreement. Uh, there were early attempts in the early decades of Christianity that Jerusalem, which would actually make much more sense, uh, would be dominant, but nevertheless we know that Peter eventually established uh, the church in Rome and the Pope to this day, the Pope is officially the Bishop of Rome, right? There's the Bishop of Indianapolis and the Bishop of Rome. In fact, uh, Sun pointed out that uh, Pope Francis is a modest person. He doesn't even like to refer to himself as Pope. He actually goes around using the title, I'm the Bishop of Rome. You're the Bishop of Baltimore, I'm the Bishop of Rome, uh, etc. Uh, and given the fact that Jews were overwhelmingly involved in the confrontation with Christian cultures, so we describe that as the Galut of Edom. Okay. And that is why we describe the Galut as the Galut Edom. Now remember, as I say, both the biblical sources and the rabbinical sources predate Islam. Right? The Talmud was completed probably in the 5th or 6th centuries and Muhammad is around 100 years later, etc. So there is what is called a fifth galut. And uh, this is articulated by the great mystic Rav Chaim Vital. Remember, Rav Chaim Vital was the disciple of the Arizal in Svat. And in fact, not only was he a disciple, but basically all of the teachings of the Ari we only know via Rav Chaim Vital. The Ari himself did not write anything. And all of his teachings are mediated through the interpretations of Rav Chaim Vital. And Rav Chaim Vital writes that before the coming of Mashiach there is going to be a fifth Galut. And this Galut will be unparalleled in cruelty. It will represent a level of persecution and destruction that will be greater in intensity than any of the exiles that preceded it. And this will be called the Galut of Yishmael. Uh, right, the Galut of Rome is called the Galut of Edom. This is called the Galut of Yishmael. And the Arizal, I'm sorry, Chaim Vital writes, quoting an, a Medrash, Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, which by the way might be the one Medrash that was written after uh, Islam. The dating is a little uncertain. Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer says that Yishmael will be the most difficult Golis of all because they have a certain spiritual quality that God has given them. They are the only nation besides the Jewish nation that have the name of God imprinted in their national identity. We are called Yisrael, he who triumphs with God, and they are called Yishmael, God will listen. God listens to their prayers, and therefore they represent a godly force. Now again, I'm going to discuss how can something be godly and coexist with evil? Well, we'll talk about that. That's a very, very important theological question. But this is a medrash. This is actually a statement. It's interesting. Nobody seemed to be aware of this medrash till 9-11. It's interesting that sometimes the press of current events forces us to re-examine sources and actually uncover things that we didn't happen to notice. But with the rise of Al-Qaeda back in, in 2001 and now ISIS and all those other negative developments. We realize the, 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 the 
prophecy, the prophetic nature of both the Medrash and Rav Chaim Vital, that there will be a Galut of Yishmael. Now let me explain a, a little bit. Uh, Yishmael, of course, was not Muslim. <laughs> that was not obviously. Uh, but number one, according to our tradition, Arab nations are considered, according to their own tradition as well, Arab nations are considered to be the genealogical descendants of Ishmael. Now, it is true that there are non-Arab Islamic nations. Iran is a very, very good example as well. Uh, but Rav Chaim Vital makes a point, again, it's, 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 it's a very intricate Kabbalistic point, that Yishmael will link up with Persia. This is what he wrote. He wrote this more than 500 years ago. That the Galut of Yishmael <coughs> will be a Hitchabrut to the genocide of Malchus Paras. Going back to the Haman roots. Now that's truly amazing. Yishmael are Arab. Paras is Persia. And therefore, uh, the concept would be that the roots of Islamic fundamentalism, whether it be Al-Qaeda, whether it be ISIS, or ISIL, as Obama likes to call it, uh, for some reason, or whether it be Iran, all of that is connected to this fifth Galut, which will be the most difficult and most bitter Galut. But you understand, obviously, when we talk about a Galut, we're not talking about Galut in the sense of exile. I mean... I mean, we're exiled. I mean, the Arabs did not exile us. But it refers to the state of persecution, the state of terrorism, the state of fear, where the whole world stands in fear over Islamo, of fascism, and a terrorism that could break out at any moment, in any place, any time. That's a galut. No matter where you live, you're in galut because you live in that fear. You have that anxiety. The world is held hostage. And Rav Chaim Vital says, predicted in the 1500s, that this will be the most difficult and painful galut of all. And he makes a point that we have a very famous verse about the coming of the Mashiach, a verse that Jesus used to his advantage. In the Navi Zechariah, it describes the Mashiach as Ani, a poor, impoverished person who is rochev ala chamor, who will ride a donkey, right? Uh, Yashka utilized that uh, uh, to try to establish his credentials. Well, we know that Yishmael is described as a chamor, a donkey. That is a, an imagery that is used for Yishmael. So what is the Pasuk telling me? That Mashiach will come into the world on the back of that donkey, that Yishmael will be the last galut that we're going to go through. Now, let me point out, I want to make four uh, short observations about the nature of galut Yishmael. The Midrashim point out that Yishmael, in spite of its riches, Yishmael as a, as a national entity, or as an inter no, as a spiritual entity, has certain merits. Number one, Yishmael had the merit of circumcision. This was the covenant. Part of the Avram covenant was made with Yishmael as well. Number two, Yishmael has a certain power of prayer. The very word Yishmael, God listens to prayer. The Muslims, as we know, are very meticulous in prayer. They pray five times a day. We only, of course, it's a shorter service. We only pray five times a day on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. They do it every day. They do it every day. They have certain spiritual powers. And therefore, the Medrash says they have a certain power over, over us that no other nation has. Asaf, Edom, simply represents hedonistic materialism <coughs> brute force the physical can always be defeated by the spiritual but when something has spiritual power it's much more difficult to defeat now here I have to raise this question 
How can we talk about Yishmael having spiritual merit? How can there be spiritual merit when you are engaged in evil actions, beheadings, torture? God listens to those prayers. So there is a concept that Mekubalim say, and I have to admit, I am not, I don't understand this concept. I will just tell you what it is. That is, just as physicists talk about matter and antimatter, or those people who are older might remember before the digital camera, if you remember the old fashioned camera with film, they, they, I don't think, do they make them anymore? Probably not. Oh, do they? They still make? Okay. Wow, okay. Wow. All righty. Uh, store up on it because it may be like an antique in a, in a, in a few years and, uh, you know, it'll let it come back. Uh, but uh, the way you constructed the positive is through the negative. Through the, the dark negative, you could construct the positive. There is a concept called, which we might call, dark spiritual energy. There is an energy of the spirits that comes through the dark side. And when there is commitment to something beyond the physical, there is a power to that, even when it's enlisting God in the cause of evil. Hard to understand. Mesirat Nefesh, being willing to give your life for a cause, has a certain power in the spiritual world even when your cause is totally perverse. You know, if you take the Nazis, for example, the Nazis were fundamentally cowards. Yeah, the Nazis, you know, these guys in the fancy uniforms were perfectly happy to kill Jews when they had all the control. But towards the end of the war, you know, many, many Nazis were willing to cut all sorts of deals that they should be treated kindly. And even those who committed suicide, they committed suicide relatively in a painless way, you know, either taking cyanide pills or the like. They were cowards. They were not really willing to die for their ideals except in the escapist way of a quick suicide. Islamic fascism are people who are willing to die for their beliefs. Now their beliefs are perverse. Their beliefs are evil. But there's a spiritual power here. Now, the implication of this is that physical can be vanquished by physical. But negative spiritual energy can be vanquished only by positive spiritual energy. And therefore, the challenge of this Galut is not going to be achieved by political and even military means. And if you think about this, this is even understood based on facts in the ground. You know, after World War II, the way, uh, during the, the, the decades that are called the Cold War, the way a peace, uh, relatively, a relatively stable peace, was maintained throughout the world for the 50 years from the end of World War II until uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Of course, Israel itself had its share of wars during that time, but let's just refer to the global picture. Was by a strategy that is aptly named with the acronym MAD. Now, MAD means Mutual Assured Destruction. Meaning to say, we knew that the Soviet Union would not dare bomb, let us say, the United States or even Israel, because they knew that the United States and later even Israel, had a second strike capacity that could seriously wipe them out. And since they didn't want to be destroyed, they're not going to try to destroy us because they don't want to be destroyed. And therefore that arms race kept an uneasy strategic balance in which I'm not going to blow you away because I don't want to be blown away. And there's a rational basis for that. But that only works when you have an enemy who doesn't want to die. When you have an enemy that not only doesn't care if it dies, but considers death to be some positive benefit of ascending to heaven with whatever number of virgins they have up there, 
then conventional deterrence of any type doesn't do anything at all because if it's going to cause an Armageddon, so be it. So the conventional military strategies simply don't work when people are devoted to a spiritual ideal as perverse as that ideal is. And then, think about the terrorism problems that we have now. You know, I, I live in the Malotafta neighborhood and we've had several terrorist incidents at the Shimon Sadik light rail station. So, what do we do? We have more police, etc. Well, what are you going to do if some guy just decides, from East Jerusalem across the street, just decides to keep his car going when there's a red light? You cross the street. What's going to stop him? The, are the police going to stop him? Are they going to kill him? Well, they'll, well, they might, but he doesn't care. There's no way, no matter how many police you have, there is really no way to stop this. Now, this has a deep mystical meaning. Because what God is telling you is, the power of the Spirit can be vanquished only by the Spirit. Military and political strategies. Now, of course, we have to do what we have to do. Of course. We can't just advocate that aspect of it. But I can tell you, it's not going to solve the conflict. It's not going to solve the conflict. When you have Palestinian children who are watching whatever their Arabic version of Sesame Street is, in which these cute little puppets, you know, take machine guns and machetes and knives and mutilate Jewish people, and that's kind of a sing song thing. You know, there's no pol particular political or military strategies that are going to address that. So, point number one, therefore, is that although tshuva is always important, but particularly when you're dealing with Galut Yishmael, the very essence of how you defeat Galut Yishmael can only be <coughs> spiritual, because their energy emanates from a spiritual source. Now, I understand the, the, the difficulty and the dilemma of dark spiritual energy. It almost, God forbid, one might interpret this almost in Zoroastrian terms, which of course would be heretical, the God of light and the God of darkness. We, of course, unequivocally reject that duality. And yet, within the framework of the spiritual universe, spiritual devotion to cause has a certain power. That is point number one. Point number two about the Golot of Ishmael and this might be the silver lining in the dark cloud, is, you know, a lot of times people say they don't want to move to Israel, they don't want to visit Israel, because Israel is dangerous, they want to raise their families where things are safe, where, you know, you don't have uh, terrorist attacks, and therefore Jews don't make Aliyah. Well, one of the unhappy lessons that we've learned since September 11th, and that's been quite a while. And of course, if you consider what's been happening in France, and in Germany, and in the United Kingdom, we've learned that no place is safe. Safety is an illusion. The world is dangerous. The world is, in many, many ways, falling apart. Now, one of the lessons that we can get from that is if it's not safe anywhere, you might as well be here. <laughs> this is God's land. This is God's holy place. And if anything, this is actually a lot safer than a lot of other places. Is it safer here than in Paris? I mean, think about what happened in Paris besides the Charlie Hebdo massacres. But there, even involving non-Islamic, I think it was a year or, a year or so ago, there was a show, a synagogue in Paris. It was surrounded by an angry mob, not even of, of Muslims, of, of French people, calling for death of the Jews. We're coming back to the Holocaust again. So this is not the best way 
best reason to make Aliyah. Hopefully there would be positive reasons to make it. But sometimes, if we don't respond to the positives, God gives us messages this way. Get out while you can. Come to Hashem's country. Be with Am Yisrael. Share your fate in the land that Hashem chose. So I think that part of the worldwide stranglehold that Dovet Yishmael has is an indirect mechanism for us to come to Eretz Yisrael. Because the argument that this is more dangerous than other places simply rings false. <coughs> it's, it's, just, it's just not true. First of all, when it comes to street crime, I mean, listen, what can I tell you? How many American cities can little kids walk around, you know, after nightfall? In my neighborhood, which actually is right across the street from East Jerusalem, we see all sorts of kids walking around, sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning. I, I don't know why they're not asleep. That's another question. Uh, but you know, uh, they're walking around. And mothers don't notice they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. that's another issue, but okay. Uh, but the point is, not too many American cities. Could you do that? Certainly not in, in Baltimore, which had its uh, riots. Again, these are not even Islamic issues uh, uh, last year and the like. A third point about Gullah Jishmael. Let me illustrate it with a story about the Briskarov. The Briskarov, Rebizek Zev Soloveitchik, was the last uh, rabbi of Brisk. Brisk was destroyed in the Holocaust. He was Rav Chaim Soloveitchik's son. And uh, he was in the Warsaw Ghetto. Tragically, he lost his wife and, and some of his children, but, but he did make, uh, he did come to Eretz Israel with uh, some of his children. And uh, he lived uh, for another another 15 years in Arizona. A great, a great, great God of the Torah. The Briskarov, as Briskers are to this very day, had what you might call a bit of a nervous temperament, but I don't want to describe it in psychological terms, but because of his great year as Shemayim, he was always worried, he was always obsessing whether he did a mitzvah properly. He would always say, did I say Shema properly? Did I do this properly? He would think and rethink and reevaluate. He was nervous in that way that he was always worried, did I do the mitzvah right? To this very day, if you ever see the way the briskers bake matzah for Pesach, it's really like a very, very elaborate procedure that takes a very long time. Now, in the Warsaw Ghetto, where people were dying like flies, dying of disease, dying of starvation, dying of Nazis just mowing people down. And the Briskarov himself lost his Rebetzin and a child. The Briskarov was unnaturally calm. He went around his business. He gave his shiurim. He davened. And he didn't seem agitated or anxious. One of his students had the chutzpah, the chutzpah they questioned, to ask him, you know, Rebbe, you're always so, I don't know how he said it exactly, but you're always so nervous all the time. And here, when there's a real reason to be nervous, you seem to be doing fine. So the Briskarov said, I'm nervous when it comes to doing mitzvot, because doing mitzvot is my responsibility. When it's my responsibility, I'm always worried. Did I do a good job? Did I not do a good job? I'm prone to mistakes. I worry about that, which is my achrayat. But what if you're in a situation where there's really nothing you can do? It's beyond your control. There's no way you can take any actions that will reasonably protect you. Some people might go crazy with their helplessness and hopelessness. He says, I'm the opposite. Precisely when I know there's nothing I can do, I hand it over to God. And I'm not anxious anymore. Now, let, let me point out, the Briskarov is not making the Pollyannish point that everything will have a happy ending. Six million Jews did die in the Holocaust. I won't get into Rabbi Mizrahi's comment that we just discussed. Mm -hmm. The Briskarov himself lost his wife and a child. 
The risk rev is not saying that life always has an immediately perceptible happy ending. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that God controls the world and there is purpose and God is a God of love and a God of compassion and if there are things in life I don't understand but I know I'm not abandoned I know I'm not rejected I know that there's an inner meaning and purpose to this even if I don't understand it as King David said in the 23rd Psalm Gam ki elech begates om of us, although I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Lo irara, I am not afraid. Yes, it is a shadow of death, but I am not afraid. Ki ata imadi, you are with me. Hashem has promised that the Jewish people will never be obliterated. Any one of us as individuals are potentially vulnerable. But God will never abandon his people. And therefore, in many ways, one of the lessons of the Gullah Yishmael, which is, as I said, there's virtually nothing we can do. You know, people say about the Islam, you know, this is the, the famous line, the vast majority of Muslims are peace-loving non-violent people. Well, that's great. So pick your percentage. There are one billion Muslims. Let's say 90% are wonderful. Let's say 95% are wonderful. You're still dealing with several times the number of Jews in the world. There is nothing but derech that we can do. But you see, our very helplessness can be a source of comfort. Because we then say, Ein lanu lihisha'en, Ela, Ela vino shabashamayim. There's nobody we can rely upon, uh, except for God. Now, you know, um, obviously, I, and I, I guess everyone here that's from the United States, we are all grateful to the United States. You know, I'm still an American citizen, as well as an Israeli citizen. I, Since I didn't run for the Knesset, I, I didn't have to resign my... American citizenship, as my friend uh, Rabbi Lipman uh, had to. Uh, and all of us are very grateful to the United States. It is, as Rav Moshe Feinstein described it, a malchus shel chesed, a kingdom of kindness and compassion. But we do have to know at the end of the day, in spite of all the rhetoric about unbreakable relationships and the like, uh, a there's a famous quote I don't know who it's attributed to but it's a famous quote that na that nations have interests and not friendships that when interests coincide so we walk together for a while when the interests don't coincide then we don't that's just the way politics work all of us know how astonishingly alone Israel fundamentally is. We really are alone. We have some nations that when it works out for them are supportive. <coughs> Most nations are in fact not supportive. And of course we have all of the and of course uh, some of our fellow Jews are themselves very very rapidly anti-Israel in ways that are just shameful. I have to say, uh, you know, I, I, this is really off topic a little bit, but uh, I, I think I would have to say that the morality of the IDF is second to none in every possible sense. There is no army in the world that is so respectful of avoiding so-called collateral damage or injury to non-combatants at great personal risk to our own soldiers in ways that many military strategists and even some rabbis have said is irresponsible. The US military certainly does not take those precautions. So for Israel to be condemned as an immoral society is very, very painful because in every possible way it works in exactly the opposite direction. And whether it's religious, secular, I would have to say that even within the secular part of the society 
Jewish values are very deeply embedded. The Jewish values of compassion and care, even for those who would try to destroy us. If a terrorist is taken to a Jewish hospital, they will get first-class medical treatment. There is even a proposal, as you know, which I think is absurd, but there is a proposal that uh, in a triage decision, if a terrorist is more seriously injured than a victim of terrorism, there is considered a proposal, the Israeli Medical Association, priority will be given to the terrorist. Again, that happens to be halakhically absurd, but it just shows you the degree of concern and care that we have. If God forbid a Jew were to enter a Palestinian hospital, forget about triage, he would not, he or she would not emerge alive. That's just it. They would not leave the hospital alive. So we are very alone. The world misunderstands. After the Holocaust, there were a few years where people felt sorry for us. No, I the word the world felt guilty, a guilty conscience. That lasted a short while. It's no longer there. Now we are the ones who perpetuate the Holocaust. The Nazi rhetoric is used against the Jewish people, not on behalf of the Jewish people. So, all of this reminds us how alone we are, how vulnerable we are. And this could be very depressing indeed. But it does remind us that ultimately all we have is God and our relationship with each other. But ultimately that's all we need. It's all we have and it's all we need. And therefore, like the Briskarov says, the very helplessness of our situation shows us that God is the one that will save us. Do you remember there's a famous Gemara, maybe you've heard this beautiful Gemara, at the end of Maseches Makos, where after the destruction of the temple, Rabbi Akiva and the rabbis are walking by the temple mount, which is totally desolate, destroyed. There were no mosques there yet, just totally abandoned. And they saw a fox, a, ro a fox, emerge from the sight of the Holy of Holies. And all of the rabbis cried and sobbed and wept. And Rabbi Akiva was laughing. And when, Rabbi, when they asked Rabbi Akiva, why are you laughing? He said to them, why are you crying? And they said, well, crying because this is the holiest place in the world that even uh, only the Kohen Gadol could go one time a year. And now all sorts of animals are just going there. And Rabbi Akiva said, I'm laughing because I know if there is such a destruction, he quoted a verse, God is going to bring the redemption as well. Until I saw the destruction, I had no guarantee there would be the redemption because they're linked. They're linked together. So this is a, a third point. So I mentioned three points. Number one, the dark spiritual energy of Yishmael can only be defeated by the spirit not by physical and military means. Number two, this is God's way to get us to Eretz Yisrael if we don't come on our own. Number three, the very helplessness of our situation engenders amuna and faith in God running the world. Now number four, I want to make a, uh, I think this might be the most inexplicable point of all. You know, I work uh, for Orsameach, and Orsameach is described as a Jewish outreach just as Ibane is, is as well, uh, right? We do Kirov. So I want to say that uh, one of the most successful Kirov organizations in the world is ISIS. <laughs> and you wonder what's going on. I mean, one of the inexplicable phenomena is that you have American teenagers, teenage girls, you know, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, they grew up... Uh, in regular America. They played soccer on Sunday and went out for ice cream afterwards. And they went to dances and they did other things. And somehow they decide, through Facebook postings, they write ISIS is very good in social media, they decide, hey, I'm going to go to Syria. 
and be part of this organization. And you wonder, how can a normal kid want to get involved in an organization that beheads people? An organization that is so pernicious that even terrorist organizations denounce them as barbaric. Got to be pretty bad if a terrorist says you've crossed the line. And in a way, this is kind of inexplicable. You could say these kids are sick. But like Rabbi Akiva, I think there's an implicit silver lining here. Because what it tells you is how deep is the yearning for some type of cause that goes beyond yourself. In a way, this is the dead end of hedonism and pleasure seeking that kids are realizing that they can't just live to make more money, have more sex, have more drugs. They want to be committed to something and like a fish out of the water, they don't know where to go. So they go to the craziest, stupidest, most evil types of things. But what does it show? It's a starvation. I want to be committed to something bigger than myself. Now this is a great challenge because as a Jewish community if we can show to our fellow Jews at least the spiritual value of Judaism and how you live beyond yourself and you're connected to a greater cause that could feed that meaning. By the way, I'll give you a similar phenomenon which Baruch Hashem is not at all the same as ISIS and that is uh, Roger Kamenetz, uh, a writer, wrote a book, uh, The Jew in the Lotus, a few years ago. I read probably 20 years ago already. And uh, he, he gave a statistic, I don't know if it's still true, that he said that 90% of the Western English-speaking converts to Buddhism are Jewish. So if you meet an English-speaking Buddhist, no, a native English-speaking Buddhist, nine out of ten chances are that they're Jewish. Now, given the fact that Buddhism may very well be technical avodazar, I'm not going to get into the halachic point there, that is a very, very disturbing number. But it highlights the idea that the Jewish soul in particular is seeking <coughs> transcendental meaning and purpose. And if nobody is showing them where they can get it in Judaism, they'll go somewhere else. And of course, ISIS is even a more extreme example. So in many, many ways, these disturbing phenomena are the stirrings and yearnings of a soul that is seeking to be connected to something greater than themselves. Right? So these are some observations on the Galut of Yishmael. But now, let me raise a textual question. How do we reconcile the phenomenon of the Galut of Yishmael with the, not only rabbinic teaching, but the biblical teaching? That there are four Galut. Right? Uh, Bavel, Paras, Yavan, Edom. If you're adding a fifth, right, so that doesn't fit the idea, then the book of Daniel, the idea of four Goliath is over and over and over and over again. So the Ebenezer actually wants to say, which is Kineget Chazal, that we count Greece and Rome as one, and the fifth one is Yishmael, and the fourth one is Yishmael. But, but Rav Chaim Vital himself says it a little differently. Rav Chaim Vital says, that we do not regard Galut Yishmael as a distinct Galut, but rather it is really a further development of Galut Edom, meaning to say we're in Galut Edom. Now just like in computer programs you have version 1 and then 1.1, 1 .1. Galut Yishmael is 1.1 of Galut Edom. Now I'll, I'll explain what that means. And therefore he points out that what is characteristic of Galut Yishmael is that there will be strategic alliances 
or connections between the West and the Arabic cultures, which will be a bad sign for the Jewish people. There'll be this his chabrut. And he brings a wonderful proof from one of the visions of Daniel. In one of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, if you remember how Daniel became a prominent member of Nebuchadnezzar's court, the same way Yosef became a Mishnah Lamelech of Paro, Yosef interpreted dreams, Paro's dreams. Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a gigantic statue. The head of the statue was gold. The torso of the statue was silver. The arms and upper legs, thighs, were uh, copper. And the lower leg and feet were iron. And then the image goes, a big rock came and toppled the statue. Daniel told him, the gold head is Babylon. You're the gold head. The torso is Persia. The, the um, copper leg is Greece. And the iron is Rome. But here is the point. The feet of the statue are described as being a composite of iron toes and clay toes. In fact, the phrase, the English phrase, feet of clay, is taken from that imagery. So if Chaim Vital says, you see that in the iron that represents Adam will be the dust that represents Yishmael. Again, Yishmael is nimshal to <coughs> dust, both because Ishmaelim were described as worshipping the dust on their feet, etc., whatever that means, and also the word for clay, for clay, is chemor, and chemor is the same word as chamor, same letters as chamor, and amadoma lechamor. So Rav Chaim Vital says, you see that at the end of the whole process there will be a taruvot, there will be a mixture of the iron and the clay, and that is the hischabrut of Esav and Yishmael. He then goes on and develops in a very Kabbalistic way, and the, uh, the process is very, very intricate, that the union in a spiritual sense of Esav and Yishmael creates the entity that we know as Amalek. So really, if the final Galut is Esav and Yishmael, the final enemy is Amalek. Again, these are spiritual ideas. We're not necessarily claiming anyone is related to Amalek. Now, this in particular has a lot of importance for us because of the following. We are in a Galut that is both the Galut of Esau, the Galut of Adam, and the Galut of Yishmael. I want to articulate the particular dangers that each pose to us. Esau represents hedonism, materialism, <coughs> consumerism, and the rejection of God. What does Esau say when Yaakov wants to buy the birthright? Esau says, I'm going to die. There's nothing beyond the physical life. I don't need the firstborn. So Esav represents a decadence and a value system in which there is no purpose for the Almighty in the world. And by the way, you may ask, well, how can I say that? Didn't I say earlier that Esav is identified also with Christianity? But the truth of the matter is, if you see the stance of most of the Christian world, religion is indeed relegated to an irrelevancy. Meaning, you know, there is this religion, but that has no impact on the political decisions of Western democracies, which are absolutely secular and have very, very strong, you know, separation of church and state. 
So even within the Christian world, life is essentially about hedonism, relegating God to a little bit of a corner, if at all. That is why Margaret Thatcher, when Margaret Thatcher needed spiritual advice, she did not go to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Anglican Church, which was largely identical to whatever secular liberalism was. She went to Rabbi Lord Jacobowitz and later Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. They were her spiritual advisors because they gave her spiritual messages that the Archbishop of Canterbury was not able or willing to give. So Asaph represents hedonism, materialism, rejection of God. Yishmael represents the appropriation of God for evil and perverse purposes. A religious fanaticism that does not reject God but besmirches God. And those are exactly the two challenges that we face in the world. We face the challenge of secular decadence and we face the challenge of religious fanaticism. But here is where it gets a bit interesting and a bit uncomfortable. These two components exist within Amalek. We know there's a commandment to eradicate Amalek. But in the Sifri Hasidus, there's a very important thought. The mitzvah of eradicating Amalek is not only what you do to an external enemy, but there's an Amalek within us that makes us vulnerable to the Amalek outside of us. And the way we eradicate Amalek is by eradicating the Amalek within and then the Amalek without loses its power. It's kind of like though they have in those uh, science fiction or even comics this idea that your nightmares become realities. And you dream about these monsters and they actually become something. It's like the Amalek within becomes the Amalek without. Now, Chazal tell us there are two Amaleks within that make us vulnerable to the Amalek without. Achilles heel number one, if I can use that metaphor, is Amalek attacked us the first time in the desert. Right? They were the first nation that attacked us after we left Egypt. And they attacked us in the oasis of Rafidim. And Rafidim is described as an acronym Rafu Yedehem Minatora. That means our hands were loose. We held the Torah loosely. Now that's an idiomatic expression, which simply means even if you keep the Torah, if you do it without passion, you do it with a lack of interest, a lack of enthusiasm, you just go through the motions. There is a coldness of heart. Amalek has an achiza over us when there's a coldness of heart and an indifference to the spiritual truths of the Torah. And we see that both from the word refidim, which is rafu yidehem mina Torah. And Rav Sadok says, we even see it from the words Asher Karcha. Now Asher Karcha is translated, they encountered you. But Rashi says, Karcha may have the etymology, they made you cold. Now Rashi explains, what does it mean they made you cold? When we left Mitzrayim, we were like a boiling hot bath. Everybody was afraid to touch us. Amalek jumped into the bath. They got burned. But they made it cooler for everybody else. That's how Rashi understands it. Rav Sado takes the same etymology, but he develops a different thought. Korcha, Amalek comes when our hearts are cold and unfeeling towards the truth of the Torah. A lack of passion. 
you know, a few months ago, uh, it's probably still going on, there was a whole discussion about Shabbos apps. You've come across this idea that, that uh, somebody is trying to develop a permissible way of texting on Shabbos or various other things. Uh, I don't want to get into the halachic aspects. They are actually complicated. And it's probably an interesting intellectual project to see, is there a way that we can do texting? But I just want to comment on the idea that the rhetoric and discussion conveys the idea that ay vey 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 Shabbos is such a bother it's such a tircha it's such a pain we gotta look for ways to avoid it to circumvent it to look for ways out so we can do as many things that we do during the week as we can that comes from the coldness in which even if you keep Shabbos so that's Achilles' heel number one. That if we want to defeat the Amalek outside of us, we have to try to generate within ourselves and our children a passion, an excitement, a geschmack in Ruchnius. Now, Achilles' heel number two is hatred and polarization among Jews. Now, how do I know that that's connected to Amalek? I mean, where do I see that to Amalek Bifrat? So we know this from a Gemara in Maseches Bava Basra. The Gemara says in Maseches Bava Basra that Amalek can only be defeated by Rachel's children, the children of Rachel. Amalek cannot be defeated by the children of Leah. That is why the first person who waged war against Amalek was Yoshua bin Nun. Moshe made Yoshua the general. What tribe is Yoshua from? Tribe of Ephraim? Rachel. That is why the first king of Israel was Shaul HaMelech from the tribe of Binyamin. And he was given the commandment to eradicate Amalek. That is why Mordechai and Esther, again from the tribe of Binyamin, were the ones who engineered the death of Haman from Amalek. And that is why there's a Moshiach ben Yosef who precedes the Moshiach ben David because his job will be to destroy Amalek. Amalek can only be defeated by Rachel. Amalek cannot be defeated by Leah. Why is that so? So again, the Mephorshim will give different reasons. But one of the great reasons that are given is that all of the children of Leah who participated in the sale of Yosef are guilty of Sinat Chinam. It is only the children of Rachel, Yosef is the victim and Benjamin was, was not involved. Only those who are free of the taint of hatred are able to destroy Amalek. And of course, Rachel herself exemplified the opposite of hatred in the selfless love and devotion that she showed her sister Leah giving away her opportunity to be the first wife by giving Rachel, giving Leah rather, these secret identifying signs. So, we see very simply that Amalek attacks us when there's coldness of the heart and Amalek attacks us when there's hatred and polarization. So I would just add that if, as Rav Chaim Vital says, Amalek is an amalgamation of Esav and Yishmael, I would like to suggest that the coldness of the heart is what we get from Esav, because Esav represents the indifference to spirituality. The hatred that comes from religious fanaticism is what we get from the Yishmael. Now again, again, I, I want to be very, very clear. In no possible way am I comparing the regrettable sinas chinam that exists within the Jewish people to what ISIS is doing. I mean, obviously, it's totally, totally different, totally different magnitude. There is no moral equivalence, of course. But what I'm saying is, spiritually, there is something similar when you use the name of God to besmirch, to belittle, to demonize, and to delegitimate. That is the Yishmael within us 
that God forbid magnifies to the Ishmael without us. And when we are indifferent or cold to our Ruchniyot, we are vulnerable to the Asavs of the world. Because once again, that indifference and that materialism gets magnified. See, Amalek hits us in two directions. Part of it is the Ishmael legacy. Part of it is the Esav legacy. Because Amalek is the composite. Now, I just want to end. I know the hour is getting late. That in many, many ways, if the spiritual way we vanquish, Yishma, vanquish Amalek, which is Esav Yishmael, is in the two directions of intensifying our passion and our commitment to Torah and at the same time growing in our love and concern for our fellow Jew and to some degree to all, all human beings. It's very interesting that in many ways these are challenges that, that on a superficial level call upon us to do opposite things because it's the nature of the human being as we get more and more committed to a particular ideology, we become less tolerant and less open and less loving and less accepting of people who espouse a different approach to things. We become, as Eric Hoffer's phrase, we become the true believers. Vice versa, those who are big tent, inclusionary people, they love everybody, sometimes they tend not to have a, a strong value system. You know, gay rights are okay, and I'm okay, you're okay, everything's okay. The big challenge for a committed Jew, and good luck in finding a school that combines these things, not at all easy, is how do you raise, not just how do you raise, how do you be a passionate, committed, fiery Jew, devoted to the Torah, loving the mitzvahs and at the same time develop within our personalities a love and an acceptance and a non-judgmental approach towards other people understanding that they're not necessarily doing what I'm doing they're not necessarily holding where I'm holding but I can love and respect and interact with them in a, in a very good way now this is a difficult challenge because you'll find people of one, on one side of the equation or on the other side. It's difficult to kind of integrate it. But part of way, the way you do it is that you realize that in your passion to serve God, part of that passionate serving of God is the love you have. In other words, it's not like a separate thing. I serve God and I also have to work on loving people. And that's pulling me in the opposite direction. But not really. Recognize that the same passion I have to have for Shabbos and for Kashras and for Tefillah and for Talmud Torah I also have to have for Abbas Yisrael. After all, it's the same Torah, same mitzvah. Or you know, it's not the same mitzvah, but it's in the same Torah. And therefore, if we, if we wouldn't look at it like a dichotomy, if we would look at it as part and parcel of what Avodah Sashem is, then we would be able to bridge that gap. Again, it's a difficult mental operation. The Balatanya t tonight is the yard service. Is that, is that correct? Mm -hmm. right. is, is it tonight? Is it tonight? Oh, it's last night. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm up one day. But we still, we could be Mosef, Michal, Allah Kodesh. Uh, so, I can say at least one thing from the Balatanya tonight. Uh, and uh, he talks about the mental operation of simultaneous love and hate. There are ideas that we reject. There are ideas we don't accept. But I still look at my fellow Jew. I see the godly soul. I see the godly essence. And I love him or her because he has within himself the spark of the divine. And if I love God, then I love God's children as well because they have that spark of the divine. So these are just some thoughts about how to deal with the difficult, difficult talut that we are in. But like everything else in life, it must start from within. 
And if we work on ourselves from within, then the enemies shall indeed vanquish because they are nothing more in a spiritual sense than the nightmarish shadows of tendencies that exist uh, within us. By our passion, we vanquish the decadence of Asaph, and by our love, we vanquish the destructiveness of Ishmael. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we would like to dump Mari afterwards. Okay. So there's uh, an interest that we can know at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.